Welcome back to another episode of Palisade Radio. This is your host, Colin Cattell. On the line with us today is a new guest to the program, Jamie Carrasco. He's a portfolio manager at Canaccord Genuity Wealth. I was linked up with Jamie just a few days ago and had great conversations about what's going on in the general market, all the manipulation that's going on in the many markets around the world. And I thought it'd be a great uh, opportunity to get Jamie on the program and share some of his thoughts as it fits nicely with uh, the resource discussions that we typically have on the show. So, Jamie, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Well, let's start kind of top-down approach. Uh, you introduced yourself to me by saying that you come from the credit side of things, and so it gives you a much different perspective than many of the other people in your industry and certainly uh, most investors. So maybe um, start by just giving us a broad uh, overview of your background and how that shapes your thoughts on the current market. Perfect. Well, my uh, the beginning of uh, when I started in the business back in 1989, I actually started with uh, Merrill Lynch on the retail side, but quickly moved over to the institutional side. I uh, became a repo trader for a Canadian company called Gordon Capital, which was one of the most uh, aggressive or entrepreneurial investment firms here in Canada. Uh, what's interesting is that because I worked on the repo desk, which was uh, really the basis of all credit derivative swaps before Glass-Steagall got taken out, I have a pretty good understanding of the credit cycle um, and what is happening. Uh, but on top of that, my background is more uh, political science and economics. I speak four languages. Um, I also love history, the history of money in particular. So I look at the big picture as to how the puzzles are shaping up. And so I tend to look at the world more, not in terms of reading balance sheets, but as uh, power shifts are occurring and also looking at the historical aspects of those shifts. Um, and that gives the, a, good, a good basis for the way I see the world in terms of puzzle shaping. And in a nutshell, if, if I had to uh, wrap it up in, in a very simple term in relation to uh, what we discussed yesterday after thinking about it, um, the, the, what comes to mind mostly is the way that the Chinese write the word danger using two words, two symbols, one for opportunity and the other one for crisis. I, I think that when I look at what is shaping up in front of us is a monetary shift and that will create an imbalance but also a lot of benefit as wealth transfers from one side to the next. Uh, and there we can talk about historical parallels that, that have really shaped the world um, uh, historically over time, because I personally think that we are at the cusp of some massive change, but at the basis of that change is the end of the current currency reserve or the U.S. dollar as a trading system and the birth of a new, of a new system. I hope I've, uh, I've described it in as, as, as succinct as I can. Yeah, absolutely, and so much to talk to you about here. So let's start with this change that you see coming. We're on the cusp, so that means there's some type of imminence to this. And one thing you talked about yesterday, which was shocking to me, is the interest rates, which are starting to move up. You're not sure if they, the powers that be, are able to uh, keep this in control. And if not, you painted a pretty dark picture for just how quickly things can spiral out of control. Well, let's, let's talk about that first, because I think it's important to understand uh, the glue of the current monetary system. And what I'm talking about is the petrodollar, right? The petrodollar, if we look at history going back to 1971, when the U.S. dollar unpegged from gold, um, it's created um, an, a global environment called the, the fiat system, where nothing is pegged to anything but the word of politicians, right? Um, if you look at the period between 1971 and 1975, we, we had a massive destabilization of the monetary system because nothing was packed by gold. But all of a sudden, that, that we, we get a glue um, or a, a, monetary sh a, a monetary adjustment because of the petrodollar. And, and what is the petrodollar? The petrodollar is the, the fact that in 1975, Henry Kissinger convinces the Saudis to start selling oil in U.S. dollars. Up to that point, it wasn't just sold in U.S. dollars. Um, and by default, convinces OPEC to start selling energy in U.S. dollars as well. This forces the world to, to start acquiring U.S. dollars. And because 
those purchases were going to be long-term purchases of energy, uh, the rest of the world starts acquiring U.S. debt. So in essence, it pegs the monetary system from some, something tangible prior to 1971 as gold into a credit cycle that begins building from that point forward because the world needs to acquire credit in order to pay for energy, and by default, they start buying U.S. debt. What I think is at the, at the, at the nut of the changes that I see going forward is the fact that the Chinese, who today are the biggest buyer of energy, back then it was the Americans, have said that they don't want to continue using the petrodollar, and they've, they've already told us that they will start trading the petro yuan on March 26 um, as a fully tradable uh, um, uh, system to buy to pay for energy, and that 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 the petro yuan as it starts to be introduced is going to start to unglue the petrodollar within the monetary system. I, I hope that 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 kind of sets the the tone because what it means is that the credit cycle that the petrodollar has created will also come unwound as less and less countries around the world, especially Asia, as they start to use the petro yuan, begin to to shy themselves away from all the credit that they needed to acquire of U.S. debt, and that will by default. And peg the petrodollar or the U.S. dollar as a currency reserve going forward. So, in essence, the the mechanics of the change are already in place, and they will continue to play forward uh, to 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 move forward going from from this point on. So, Jamie, we have a weakening U.S. dollar since Trump came into office, and kind of coinciding with that, we've seen interest rates. You told me yesterday have gone from about 1.5 up to 2.9, so almost a double. You were talking about the historical analysis you've done and just how quickly uh, that interest rate move can accelerate. What do you think that that could look like? Well, I think it's important to understand that when, when the credit cycle starts to unwind, there comes a point that it becomes uncontrollable. Unless and less demand for dollars uh, accelerates, rates will start to increase, and there might be a point. And I think we're personally, I think we're getting pretty clear to that when they will lose control of the interest rate cycle. What do I mean by that? Central banks can control the overnight rate. You know that that's where they definitely have a control. But anything beyond the the five to five, seven, ten, and thirty year bond is controlled by the buyers of that debt. You know, they, they, they can never print enough money to control that side of the market. So what we will see is as the 10-year rates start to start to climb, it will also affect the economy because the 10-year rate is the pegging for, for example, mortgages in the U.S. It's, it's one of the most important uh, benchmarks for interest for the interest rate cycle. So, you know, everybody at the beginning of last year was saying that interest rates were going to go up. Instead, they have climbed. By the same token, everybody was thinking that the dollar was going to appreciate, but uh, the high watermark for the dollar was the week of inauguration of the Trump administration when it hit 103 on the USDX, the U.S. dollar basket. Now, I see them one and all because it, it's important to understand that in a monetary system, which is not ba based by anything, the dollar is just debt with zero maturity. So to me, the dollar and the 30-year bond are all one. By devaluing the dollar that itself, what you're doing is devaluing everything, right? And that's why, to me, the dollar and debt are such an important benchmark for the economy. Now, um, now that we are almost at 3%, the way I see it is if it took, um, if June of 2016, call it June, July of 2016, yields of 10-year yield hit 1.5, we're almost at 3, so that's almost 20 months. So if it took 20 months to get to, to, to double, it means that it'll take 10 months to double again and five months to double again and two and a half months to double again. Once they lose control of the system, that's the way debt has always played out. And that is concerning because nobody's thinking forward as interest rates start to rise. And that'll, that'll create a, a situation that even Greenspan has been warning about, and that's stagflation, inflation with no growth. Because as rates rise, it slows down the global economy, especially the U.S. economy. But by the same token, you're getting inflation because the cost of goods is going higher, which we're already seeing. But the way they're counting inflation, I don't think it's, uh, it's a true measure of inflation because of the hedonic adjustments and everything else. 
right? Quick question on inflation. If there is no inflation, why, why has Walt Disney just raised the prices of their, of, of, of going to, to visit uh, uh, Walt Disney by almost 12%? Right, so so there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that inflation is already in the system, but it'll continue to accelerate as as the dollar depreciates. So before jumping into what the shift will look like and the implications and ways to profit investment wise, for an average American or Canadian on the ground, what are some implications, general trends that they'll see? You've already pointed to uh, inflation, costs of things are going up, but. Um, maybe the housing market will will drastically change because uh, the mortgage is obviously based on that interest rate. What else can we be looking for? Well, higher cost of living. Bottom line: look at food. Look, why are we filling up at a one twenty five? I filled up today at the gas station. If um, if uh, oil prices, um, oil demand isn't really, you know, the economy isn't improving that much, right? Uh, food costs continue to escalate. Uh, rents continue to escalate. It's cost of living that's getting more expensive. But by the same token, incomes are not really improving that much. Now we're starting to see a little bit of wage inflation kicking in, but that's because of the demand of labor, right? So that'll also start to accelerate. Greenspan called it very, very well, and I actually have an interview on my on my LinkedIn blog of an interview that he did last July where he said that um, we face a similar situation, but worse than the 80s, right? And that the cost of living is going up, but we're not going to see much economic growth. So that's stagflation. And that's, I think, is what we have to prepare for. The, the way I see it is that what comes next is just a, a transfer of assets from one area to the next. And that's going to be from, from any, everything that was tied to the credit cycle to the hard assets, which can't devalue um, um, as the credit cycle unwinds. Probably most familiar to our audience would be uh, the the hard assets being gold and gold stocks and the other commodities. So let's start there. Uh, I guess the question is, many people say that gold is supposed to be a leading indicator of inflation. And as you pointed out, inflation is starting to show. In fact, for the first time I've ever seen about a month ago, headlines all over Fox, CNN, Bloomberg saying wage inflation is being seen. And yet gold is doing okay. It's certainly not uh, performing wildly. So what do you see playing out there? When will that kick into gear? Okay, before we talk about gold, I think it's important to understand the way I see the world. To me, everything is being manipulated. Central banks have, cre- have created a massive facade since 2008 in, 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 their, in their ability to influence markets, whether they've been influencing them higher or lower. Like if you look at the stock market, I think the rise of the stock market in the U.S. has been a facade because a lot of that has been inflation. The inflation is showing in the stock market, you know, be it through through um, share buybacks or the futures contracts as they're pushing the markets higher, right? If if uh, what I look at is the fact that if you look at true economic growth over the last ten years, it has averaged about one point seven percent. Well, the market should have kept up at a one percent seven rate, um, um, at a one per, per one point seven. Uh, rate of growth going forward if that was true economic growth, but it hasn't. It has, it has gone much faster because of the, of the influence of central banks who are buying up the market and you have, you know, it's being done through the futures contract. So the way I see the world is that everything has been manipulated either higher or lower, you know, which is the case with the precious metals. Um, it's not just me saying it. Uh, Terry Duffy, the head of the COMEX at the, the same month that, that Greenspan did that interview, he was interviewed and asked as to why the safe harbor assets aren't moving. And he said, to quote him, he said, if gold was uh, keeping up with inflation right now, it should be around two to $3,000. And if you look at what's going on around the world, it should be around five to $6,000, but it isn't. And so people should expect much higher prices at some point. That, that's a quote from him, and I have the interview as well on my LinkedIn page. The, the point that I'm trying to make is that, in my view, what's going to happen is as interest rates start to climb, the central bank's ability to manipulate the market is going to start to decline because it's being done through the credit cycle. So all markets will find their true value, their true net asset value. And that value for the stock market and the bond market is much lower, and for the precious metals, it's much higher. 
So the way that I'm positioning myself and advising clients is that we start to position and continue to position in the areas that are going to revalue higher while foregoing the areas that have been valued um, uh, sorry, in the areas that have been revalued lower and are going to are going to have to go higher, and and shy away from the markets that have been pushed higher because they can only go lower. So when it comes to when it comes to to gold and silver, uh, the real question that I have is this: Would people be as uh, excited about jumping in the Dow if gold was anywhere near two thousand dollars. No, they wouldn't. They would be questioning twice: Should I be buying the Dow because gold now is signaling a different story, right? But since it's been manipulated lower to the extent that it has been, people are not really questioning uh, what is going on. On the other hand, though, the Chinese and the Asians have been taking away the physical gold away, which is also setting us up for for the mon- monetary shift that is coming, because it's a, it's a fact that the Chinese have been taking away a, quite a bit of gold, and it, it, it adds up to about 18,000 tons that is sitting, that has left the West since 2008. Jamie, if you look globally at all the different asset classes, uh, some people have referred to what's going on right now as an everything bubble, which makes sense because of, uh, as you stated, the, the credit that's been pushing these markets up. Aside from gold, the commodities, and the related stocks, can you identify any sector that is relatively or absolutely depressed um, rel- yeah, relative to these other markets that, that will benefit? I wouldn't say depressed. I would say in its birth stage, and I'm talking about blockchain. I think blockchain is the most amazing um, destructive technology to come in a long way. And it's, it's growing on a global basis. Um, and that will continue to grow because right now we've just crossed 4% global integration and it will only continue to grow and, and um, disrupt quite a bit of industry that need disruption. I'm talking about the financial industry because the financial industry to a big extent has been the one that has benefited and been bailed out by central banks to keep this facade going. Right? The, the 2008, some people should have ended up in jail, but they didn't. Uh, and they're still running the system the same way they did, and that's coming to an end. The benefit of the reason why I'm excited about blockchain is because in 2008, if the system had actually imploded the way that a lot of people foresaw it happening, we didn't have an alternative to keep going. Today we do. And so I think that as we go through this change that is coming, now we have a technology that will allow us to continue functioning and transacting um, uh, in a financial system through a technological solution to the problem. So blockchain and the precious metals I find extremely beneficial as well as the, the commodities. Commodities are in the, in, in, you know, they haven't been this cheap in a long time and we have massive global growth occurring, right? So, so when I add that to the fact that the Silk Road, the, the infrastructure projects that are going on in Asia, which are really going to drive the global economy for the next 100 years. Um, and we're talking about the bulk of global population. Um, I see a lot of benefit in, in, in the change that is coming, and it's about positioning properly now. However, when I say positioning, I think it's, we, ha- we have to be very clear that, in my opinion, we are at a crossroads similar to 1929. If you look mm-hmm. at, at events in 1929, that was the last time that the world – was driven by a credit cycle to the extent of what we're going now, but it wasn't nothing in relation to what we have today because of the credit derivatives, right, which are not even counted within the system, but it is credit that is, gonna, it, that is bound to unwound and destroy itself when the true day of reckoning comes. People often say that the past repeats or history rhymes, and so much can be garnered from understanding history as you're talking about now. Uh, but this uh, concept of blockchain uh, is also a scenario we've never seen play out or anything like it before. It's got the potential to uh, create a system where there is not a central power and people can opt into systems based on uh, purely what they want and, and no coercion. So how do you balance uh, looking back in history, Jamie, with this completely new concept that you really can't uh, find any precedent for? Well, it's funny because every time we go through monetary system changes, and I'm talking about currency reserve changes like the 30s, 
uh, the French Revolution, which is another point when the when the currency reserve changes from the from the French uh, sou at the time to the pound, and then they from went from the pound to the dollar. We always go through through massive social changes of social and political restructuring, where the social con- contract gets re- uh, redefined, and that's inevitable this time around again. Because people haven't f- really figured out that pension funds are going to be in massive trouble. Because over the last 10 years, we've been foregoing the benefit of the pensioners on behalf of saving the, the financial industry, right? So we kept interest rates extremely low. It's funny because the 10-year bond is held by every pension fund in the world, and that's going to see massive wealth destruction as interest rates start to go up, right? So because of that, we are going to end up redefining the social structure once again. The benefit of blockchain, though, is the fact that now we have a technological solution to being able to um, to guarantee that my vote is my vote through blockchain, um, and that will, by default, change the social structure or the social contract at some point in the future, and I see that coming. But I, it will also change the way we, we communicate and the way we do business to a even greater extent that the internet has. Now, what's interesting is that if you think about this, the internet has given rise to blockchain because the internet has united us on a global basis. And all of a sudden you have this technological solution that is riding on the internet and is growing out of the fact that we've created the cloud and the cloud has united us and all of a sudden the blockchain is growing and it will continue growing. But by the same token, it will unite us on a financial basis because today I can send money to China using the blockchain without having to pay for the transaction costs of of converting money, having it wired and pay a fee here, a fee there, a fee there, and it's automatic, it's 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 seamless and it's it's doable. Right? And so it's about acceptance. It's funny because a lot of people ask me, well what are you going to do with those Litecoins? How are you going to buy them back to uh, switch them back to Canadian dollars, right? Well, that's not the point. I haven't written a letter in a long time. Once I started using email, we don't go back to letter. It's the same analogy. The the point is is as more and more people start to acquire Litecoin or whatever the whatever the coins are that we're going to transact in, it's about acceptance. It's about uh, allowing somebody in Asia, for example, to rent me uh, a rental property for a holiday, pay, getting paid in Litecoin. It's about acceptance. And so it, 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 people have to change their thinking in terms of how blockchain is going to affect. As, as more and more people around the world start to accept it, we're going beyond borders. We're going into, into a, a communication uh, that is global. And so that, by default, changes the structure of the way we communicate with each other and the way we transact with each other. So I find it an extremely liberating and, and uh, destabilizing technology. Jamie, if I were looking for somebody to manage my money, I'd want somebody with your uh, understanding of history and your 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 caliber of uh, of insight to be the person doing that. And also, I find it interesting that you're one of the few people who uh, shares my kind of philosophical ideas and has a very uh, not to label you, but libertarian uh, mindset on things. It seems. What what exactly are you doing if people want to get in touch with you? What does your investment strategy look like? Well, it's funny because you said that I, the, the one thing I thought to myself, you should take a look at my special opportunities fund. It, it, let, let me touch base on, on back to the libertarian thing and, and what you just said. I find amazing the discussion, the black and white that's, that's arising between the gold bugs and the, and the Bitcoin people or the blockchain people when they don't realize that one is the solution to the other. Right. If you look at, at Bitcoin itself, it was set up by people that understood exactly why I like gold, because it was, they, they wanted something that can be manipulated. Right. Well, blockchain itself is the solution to the game that's being played with gold, where they're not really trading paper, con- uh, sorry, uh, physical gold. What they're doing is trading paper contracts. Right, so it's like a game of musical chairs with a piece of paper, but everybody, but but the Chinese keep pulling the chairs away. So there's more and more people, um, more and more people uh, playing around these chairs, and there's less and less chairs remaining. Right. Well, blockchain will solve that problem. So because money, as money, gold can only be money. Right. Because there could be one one Bitcoin, but then I could come up with another one, and so a different one. 
but there will only be one gold, right? And and so because of that, I, I think there's a blend. There's a, the, the, there's the, we can rebuild the monetary system using gold and blockchain and go back to exactly the same system that Isaac Newton set up, who, by the way, set up the, mo- the, the, the gold back monetary system for the British back in the 1700s. But today, Newton would have used blockchain to do it. Right, so so I think it's a blend, and that's what my special opportunities portfolio is trying to do. First of all, I prefer I use I see gold itself as money. So if I have a client that wants to hold U.S. dollars, Canadian dollars, euros, I also recommend hold gold and silver as money. But the speculation is in the companies. Why? Because if you look at the last time the monetary system readjusted in the in in 1930. 33 when Roosevelt rises the price of gold from 7 to 35 bucks well the producers were still producing it at 5 so all of a sudden from going they're not making $2 an ounce they're making 30 um, almost $30 an ounce right and so through the great depression they were the best investment that's why I like the producers history is about to repeat itself and the producers will once again be the prime beneficiaries of that on top of that, I'm also looking for investment in the blockchain. I, w- I, I participated in Hive as soon as I found out what they were doing, that they were, it was ex-Macquarie guys, by the way, who I used to be with Macquarie, uh, that were setting it up and they were going to be mining Ethereum. As soon as I heard that, I needed to find out more and I got my clients, myself, into the private placement. I just participated in Omer's uh, new entry into blockchain, which is also Ethereum, which validated my strategy. Uh, the fact that one of Canada's biggest pension funds also has figured it out, their tech side, and they've set up this IPO, and lucky lucky for me, uh, Canaccord was participating in that. I thought it was it was complete karma, right? So so the Special Opportunities Fund is it was set up as a standalone uh, solution for the fact that most most people don't own any precious metals. So I wanted to create a vehicle for those that once they get it, they need to park, you know, at least two to three percent or 5% of the, of the financial net worth in a precious metals vehicle, well, that's what that solution is. The other portfolio I manage, which is more general for people that need to generate income like my parents, well, that is set up to benefit from inflation because the net result of this shift that is going to occur is going to be inflationary. So there are companies like pipelines, utilities, all those that can pass the, their increases to the to their users um, they're going to benefit greatly as we go through this transition. So the way I see it is about positioning myself ahead of the curve before the change. But people have to understand that the change that comes now is going to be is going to be traumatic in terms of how it's going to reshape the global economy and the monetary and financial system. A parting thought. Uh, when one thing goes down, that money has to transfer to another person or place. You pointed that out at the beginning of the interview. And there's a lot of money in dollar figures out there and a lot of inflated asset classes right now. And if a lot of that money moves into gold and blockchain associated uh, assets, the, the bull market we're going to get is going to be incredible and sustained um, in, in terms of I duration. I fully, fully agree. It's funny because the, the, the two rules that I was early taught, taught at Gordon Capital, there were two things that were taught to me. One was when everybody gets it, there's no money to be made. So in a way, I'm, you know, I've been patiently waiting for it, but uh, waiting for this to occur. I like the fact that nobody's seen it, nobody owns any precious metals because eventually they're going to come in uh, and I own a lot of them. But the other, the other interesting lesson that I, that, I, that I was told was that money or wealth is a blob on a platter that is always the blob will grow and decline, but it's always shifting one from one side of the platter to the next. Right, so it's about positioning yourself where it's going versus where it is, you know, which is not really how people think. You know, we're back at the same setup as 2008 again, I think, and people have not learned a damn lesson. Right, it's that FOMO, the fear of missing out. They they got to run into the Dow now at the at the very top because it's going to go on forever. Well, it didn't in 2008, it didn't in 2000, it did it in 98, but they keep going. Right. Well, the problem is, is that now comes a final cleansing, and I'd rather be where the where the where the blob is going to go into the precious metals. Nobody owns any, so I'd be very glad when people start to figure out, you know, without one, two, three, five percent allocation, as they did in the in the eighties, right? And it's a matter of waiting it and 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 um, and uh, being patient. Now, 
on the price of gold, I think that once we break through 1350, 1360, and it's amazing the amount of pressure that is being put, especially like right now at the at month end when the options are expiring so that they can roll over those musical chair contracts, right? One of these days they're just going to lose control and it's going to blow. It's going to go higher and then there's some some payments to be made at that point because there's, some people are going to have some massive losses. My my strategy is to position myself ahead of that on the right side of the curve. Well, Jamie, this has been an incredibly informative interview and one that could probably go on for much longer. Uh, but I have a solution to that, which is we'll get you back on the show in a few weeks to dive a bit deeper. I'm sure there will be a lot of questions uh, from the audience sent to me that they will want me to ask you next time we get you on. Thank you very much for coming on and sharing your insights. And uh, I guess if anybody does want to get in touch with you, could you provide some way for them to do that? Yeah, the best way to go is to, is to um, uh, if you can put, a, I'll send you a link to my uh, LinkedIn page and all of my contact information, my thoughts, my blog are there and people can follow um, my thoughts on things. I, I write a lot of a lot of pieces that I that I post there, but I also keep a blog of daily news because this the message is being sent, it's being said, right? But but it's being confused with a lot of noise being put out by the mainstream media. But there are some interviews that make sense, like the Martino Booth, for example, Richard Fisher's ex right hand man, who's been telling us that the the central banks are losing control and people people better prepare, right? So, so that's the best place to reach me, and I'll send you a link to it, and you guys can post it uh, when, you, when you post this interview. But it's been a pleasure chatting with you, and I'll be very happy to come on board again now that I can start doing interviews again. Great. Jamie, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Pleasure. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bid. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?